This is Graham Hancock. I know I don't like debunking people, but let's have a listen to what he says here. This is quite interesting. That I would never seek to divorce the ancient Egyptians from the Great Pyramids. Are, there are several reasons, actually. But first and foremost, I have no doubt that the ancient Egyptians were involved in completing the Great Pyramids, and there's four reasons for that. And that is the shafts, the so-called air shafts, that cut through the body of the Great Pyramid. Uh, they're very small. Um, they're about that wide, that high. There are two of them in... So just bear with me, I will point my points out in a sec. The so-called King's Chamber. Yeah. One on the north wall, one on the south wall. And they... Did you see that? It didn't actually go all the way out to the outside on that image. Keep that in your mind. Always exited on the outside of the pyramid. And that was known back into the 19th century. You know, 19th century explorers could actually climb the Great Pyramid and roll a cannonball into one of those shafts and it would end up in the king's chain so well actually that doesn't seem correct because a um there was a project called uh i won't even try and pronounce that where basically they found out that both shafts kings and queens do turn at a uh, 45 degree angle going up towards the top of the pyramid not out and in fact also if that was the case then we would be sending cameras down from the outside not inside if you ever watch the documentaries on the history channel they sit they have to go inside the the pyramid and put their remote control cameras up uh with wheels whereas if if you could just roll a camera down you could quite easily put a ball a camera inside a ball and just roll it down and then pull it back up with wire so it's <laughs> Yeah, so I think he's wrong there. Right. Obviously, they were connected. The shafts in the so-called Queen's Chamber, and I use the word so-called because we actually don't know what these chambers were for. No, no burial of any pharaoh was ever found inside the Great Pyramid. Um, the so-called Queen's Chamber, the shafts don't exit on the outside of the Great Pyramid, and nor until 1872 were they visible within the Queen's Chamber itself. They'd been closed off with little facing blocks. So you, you couldn't see that they were there. But one researcher went around tapping on the walls. He thought, there's shafts upstairs in the king's chamber. Maybe there are here. And he found two hollow points, one on the north wall, one on the south wall, broke them open, and lo and behold, there were the concealed shafts. Now, the thing about those shafts is that all four of them point at key stars, one of them being the lowest of the three stars of Orion's belt. In the position in the sky that they occupied around 2,500 BC, not 12,500 years ago, so in other words, he's saying that these were built two and a half thousand years ago, when at that point everyone was writing, whereas obviously 10,000, 12,000 years ago, there was only a handful of people that could read or write, and yet no pyramids. You've got to remember also, there's a thousand pyramids around the world, so he's now attributing this to the Egyptians, which is stupid, Graham Hancock, stupid, because you've got the Bosnian pyramids is absolutely massive, and the Egyptians weren't there. So, uh, and there's pyramids, a thousand pyramids around the world. So they would have, the architects of this would have had to have gone all the way around and done them there, or we're all just that clever. Anyway, let's carry on. But four and a half thousand years ago, and that astronomical connection to the stars at that time says to me we cannot divorce the ancient Egyptians from the Great Pyramid. So basically, he's saying because the well, I'll let you play on. Uh, but then there's a problem. The ground pattern on the three pyramids on the ground reflects the pattern of Orion's belt right, itself. Yeah. And this is, of course... Not so much. So I've actually done a video showing there's at least 15 other constellations that do have two stars and one off-centre. So they're assuming, and I don't like people that assume, because it makes an arse out of you and me. No accident within the ancient Egyptian system, uh, because... The constellation of Orion was seen as the celestial image of the god Osiris, mm -hmm. the civilization bringer, the entity who went around the world teaching civilization. That is who Osiris is, and he is seen in the sky. His image is seen in the sky as the constellation of, of Orion. And what so, so basically, he's, he's admitting that there was a god called Osiris that went round and taught people how to do things. But he's saying it was the Egyptians that built the pyramids. Now, which one is it? Is it the Egyptians or is it the god? You see my point? It just uh, he's, he's, I think he's clutching at straws here. One of those shafts points at Orion's belt and another one points at, at Sirius and two of them point at the circumpolar stars. So that's only if you turn the clocks back again. I've done another video where I turned the clock back thousands and thousands of years ago and my front door points to, yes, 
to the Draco system, which means uh, my ancestors must have been aliens and reptilian ones at that. So basically, you can turn this the clock back to any time you want, and something will be pointing at something that you want it to point to. I've I've already covered this in my other videos. Uh, at the time uh, when ecologists believe the pyramids were built, so there's definitely a connection, and I wouldn't seek to break it. But well, there's, you've not. There's no connection. There's no connection. So the Anunnaki could have quite easily built these pyramids, 10,000, as it says so in the Columbia University tablets, uh, 10,000 BC, just after the Great Flood, and the Anunnaki built them, which is why we've got no records of any humans building them at all, because obviously there was none. And the Sphinx was built by um, Ningazida for the lion because of the constellation because at that point they started to use earth's um years as opposed to their shahs and so he built the lion to say this is the time period and he put his face on it to say this is who built the pyramids so i don't know graham i think you are pandering to people you you know if you think that the egyptians went round to every single country and built a thousand odd pyramids and moved moved the stones etc uh, from you know seventy five miles away over hills mud tr you know in in other countries as well by the way um and all did that for a bit of a giggle uh because obviously unless there's a reason for these pyramids, which we know there's a reason for these pyramids uh but the Egyptians at the time wouldn't have known uh because they probably would have thought the planet was flat at that point so um uh, yeah, so I don't know I mean I like Graham, but I think on this one he's just uh, a bit out there. What's your thoughts? Breaking news, mainstream is stupid. <laughs> so basically they're saying now new research claims that Stonehenge stones were not transported from Wales because they're such a distance away that there's no way that any normal person would be able to carry those uh, stones unless it was aliens. And so here they basically go on and try and say that it's it's not from wales but they're not really sure what they're talking about however if you actually want to know what they're talking about go to my patreon page our true history click on the collections you're going to love this because i've already done a video and then scroll down to the one that says over 150 odd videos here long ones documentaries go to uh the one that says everything else now i've actually done a video showing why stonehenge is exactly there solved and it really is it's 31 minute long documentary with evidence so if you want to know either listen to mainstream where they have no idea what they're talking about or go to my patreon page the anunnaki were blue skinned and white and black and looked like reptilians they had slave workers called the igigi and they were from another planet the anunnaki created humans and accidentally made giants those giants built the pyramids the Atlanteans were on the moon and had many fights with the Anunnaki. The alien Anunnaki gods had stargates and could go anywhere they wanted. They also made humans all look different around the world. For example, that's why white people don't look the same as Chinese. Of course, Noah's Ark was a spaceship. Any bad researcher will tell you that. Hang on a minute. I've just told you a lot of rubbish. All these theories are from bad researchers. Even normal people on TikTok make videos like this. They get way more views and shares than my videos, which show evidence. If you actually want the evidence instead of people just talking and making up stuff, visit our truehistory.co.uk. The difference between me and anyone else out there, I show the evidence, they just talk. Neanderthal was possibly as smart as us, according to a new study here. Basically, it says that it may have just been cultural differences as opposed to brain power. So, in other words, they were smart. However, here in the ancient tablets that called it Enki and Nimna, where Enki and uh, Nimna end up creating a first Homo sapien, in other words, the first human, it's because the Neanderthals weren't smart enough to do the job that they required. And here it says, my mother, the creature you planned will really come into existence, impose on him the, uh, the work of carrying the baskets. Now, if Neanderthal was already smart, they could have done that without needing to be upgraded to Homo sapiens. But then it says, uh, a bit further down, it says, Homo sapiens... Uh, inhabited South Africa, which is where the Anunnaki were, correct? Uh, but perhaps 100,000 years ago, they migrated. Well, actually, according to this tablet here, which is the uh, story of Adapa, that's when the Anunnaki bred. Who Yahweh really was. Documentary with evidence from our true history. 
I'll start with the premise that Yahweh is not an almighty being. The reason why he's not is because the video I done called The Lost Book of Our True History proves the gods were an alien race that we know as Anunnaki. Their race name is God, just like we are human. Please watch that video if you need to see the evidence that the Bible copied the older texts. Yahweh is named for the God of the Israelites. Why not the God of the universe? That's because there were many gods, many Anunnaki. If Yahweh is not an almighty being, and the only ones on earth that were called gods were the Anunnaki, it stands to reason that one of the Anunnaki was Yahweh. Many Anunnaki names have been given to Yahweh, and some have even said who I'm going to say it is, but I'll be the only one to give the connecting evidence. Let's first look at the first mention of Yahweh. I'm using a clip from a video called Who is Yahweh? How a warrior storm god became the god of the Israelites and world monotheism on YouTube by Dr. Justin Sledge on his channel Esoterica. In fact, this god, whose simple name means something like the one that exists, emerged from the sands of Bronze Age obscurity to eventually become not just a national god, but, in the end, simply the god. In the early stages of Israelite religion, El is often mentioned as a prominent deity. The name El is a generic Semitic term for god or deity and was used in various ancient Near Eastern cultures. El is associated with a fatherly figure, often depicted as the head of the pantheon. Over time, there seems to have been a theological shift and the worship of Yahweh gained prominence among the ancient Israelites. The process of monotheization where a polytheistic pantheon transforms into a monotheistic belief system, likely played a role in the development of the Israelite religion. I'm breaking down the differences between El and Yahweh now, so that later on you'll understand why the two were connected. Let's start with El. He was usually portrayed as an old man with a long beard and often two wings. That's interesting because in Sumerian carvings, some of the Anunnaki were carved with wings. Why would a god in need to be depicted with wings? I can't think of a reason, but let's look at why the Anunnaki would have been show with wings. That also goes for the Egyptian gods who were also Anunnaki. Wings in many ancient cultures are often symbolic of divine attributes and supernatural power. The inclusion of wings with the Anunnaki may signify their elevated, otherworldly status and their association with the divine realm. In some depictions, winged beings are associated with messengers or intermediaries between the earthly and celestial realms. The wings may symbolise the ability to traverse between different realms, conveying messages or acting as intermediaries between gods and humans. Wings can also be associated with celestial bodies, such as birds representing the sky or heavenly beings. By depicting the Anunnaki with wings, artists may have sought to convey a connection between these deities and cosmic forces emphasising their influence over natural and celestial realms. That makes a lot of sense. The main gods, Anunnaki, needed to show they were from heaven, which has been proven to mean space. I think we can agree that the reason El would have been shown with wings is because El was one of the main Anunnaki. But what about the long beard? El is said to have had a long beard before he became very old and frail and shaved it off. Why does an almighty being need a beard? I can't think of a reason, can you? But what about the Anunnaki? Did they have beards? Absolutely. It was a huge status for them to have beards. This is starting to look like El was one of the main Anunnaki. But which one? The clue is his age, the god named El, seems to only be used as an old god. Who could have been an old Anunnaki god around that time? The time El was first mentioned is about 3,000 years ago. That's 1,000 years before Christ. There is no Anunnaki by the name of El, but the Anunnaki did change their own names many, many times. Ea became Enki, for example, and Inanna was her Sumerian name, but Akkadians called her Ishtar. Who would have been a main god that would be old and would have had wings? Enlil. Enlil was a major deity in the ancient Mesopotamian pantheon, particularly in Sumerian and Akkadian, Babylonian and Assyrian stories. His name, Enlil, means Lord Wind in Sumerian reflecting his association with the forces of nature, particularly wind and storm. But if Enlil was El and was old and frail, where does Yahweh come into this? I hear you ask. Before I get to Yahweh, I must let you know Enlil had a wife called Ninlil, 
But did El have a wife? Asherah is the name that appears to be his wife. Could that wife have been Ninlil? But because their region around 3,000 years ago, they were worshipped in the Canaanite and Ugaritic traditions, meaning they may have had different names, just like Inanna and Ishtar. I'll cover Asherah a little later. She is important to Yahweh rise in power as the main god. Around 4,000 years ago, there were wars between the Anunnaki. They used the humans to fight their battles. In some cases, they even used nukes. See my other videos for evidence. One Anunnaki called... The rest of this documentary, including the real name of Yahweh, is on the Patreon page. There is over 150 other long documentaries there with answers to subjects like why was Stonehenge put exactly there? Why Easter Island statues were not made by man? Who the Norse gods were? The list goes on. Jump over to the Patreon page, patreon.com, Our True History, or visit my website where you can get to everything from there, ourtruehistory.co.uk. This guy is going to explain about the Great Flood and this tablet here. So I'm just going to let it play and then I'll give you my thoughts on it. And he builds a boat and... Unlike in the, in, the, in the flood account in Genesis, where all animals are taken in, in the Sumerian account, it's only domesticated animals. And after a while, the flood abates. So, so there's actually tablets in the Columbia University that actually goes into more detail about why the Anunnaki, um, why Enki told his son to build a boat. Yes, his son. That was not Lamesh's son. It was actually Enki's son, which is why he ended up looking different from Lamesh. Uh, but it's all in the Columbia University, not the Penn Museum here, which is this one here. But anyway, let's have a listen. This must be a myth that's common throughout the whole region. So he's saying that it must be a myth, the flood. But then listen to this. As I say, this is the earliest one that we have. And interestingly, there is some pretty good evidence that there was a dramatic flood in this area. So if you look at this slide here, this is the Great Trench that was excavated um, at the site of Ur, not that far from Nippur. And so that entire depth is all human occupation. And at the bottom, Woolley found this thick layer of alluvial mud, which is what we would get from it if you had a huge flood there. And so it is quite possible that the region did experience a very big flood that actually then seeped into the common consciousness of the whole um, region. <laughs> Seeped into. Basically, the flood happened. We've got enough evidence to show, not just for where he's talking about, but loads of other places where uh, the ocean sediment is actually buried, buildings, etc., that predate the flood, which was obviously the Anunnaki's buildings. So, once again, museums are actually agreeing with not Sakurai Sitchin, but with the tablets that the Anunnaki came here and genetically modified us and eventually noah which was his real name original name was azia zudra uh, which was enki's son if you're interested in finding out the evidence of all of this feel free to follow my videos because i show where everything comes from this is the director of the Penn museum who's actually agreeing with a gentleman called zachariah sitchin that wrote books on the anunnaki the alien race that genetically created us and here this guy is talking about this uh, relief or this carving where well I'll let you listen palace and the genie was an, uh, an individual who gave civilization to people all of the things that made civilization worth while although somebody rather uncharitably pointed out the other day that he appears to be holding a handbag I've covered what the handbag is in, my, in previous videos but the point is, is this guy's agreeing with Sakurai Sitchin so in other words the stories of the Anunnaki teaching us. Now, all you have to do is just look at where everything suddenly sprang from. Money, agriculture, um, textiles, all from the same place that this gentleman here told us and taught us, Sumer in Mesopotamia. So the Anunnaki were real. Transcript of classified tape recording made at Camp David, Maryland, during a presidential briefing regarding the subject of unidentified flying objects and extraterrestrial visitation of Earth. President Ronald Reagan was present. The recording was made between March 6 and 8, 1981. William Casey. Mr. President, good morning. As we discussed in February, this briefing contains some very sensational and some very, very classified information. I am not sure 
Oh, well, I'm not going to make a decision on who you want in the room. That will be your decision, Mr. President. This will be a real tough one to follow since the briefing starts back, historically speaking, that is, and runs up to recent times. I believe we have prepared a good chronological order of events. I'm sure you, Mr. President, will have many questions. The list of questions presented to me by Advisor Dortu should all be answered during this briefing. I hope they are, more than anyone, especially you, Mr. President. Leave this briefing with questions still unanswered. I have asked the caretaker to conduct this briefing. He is a contract employee of the CIA and is the present custodian of the information. Are we to assume that everyone is present? President. Well, it will be entirely up to you, Bill. I guess everyone must be cleared for this briefing of information. Is that not correct? W.M. Kase. Well, it appears everyone is, but as you will see, Mr. President, this stuff is pretty high up on the food chain. We call it ATS or above top secret. This stuff has its own classification and markings. We have a special container, special printers and copiers for this stuff. Every word of this material is printed on special paper, then placed inside special covers. The caretakers have taken special efforts to protect all of this stuff from being released inadvertently or copied by some unauthorized person. But all of this material is protected by a special group of people. The caretaker is in charge of protecting this information and all of the other stuff associated with this information. I would prefer that you, Mr. President, decide on who you want in this room. Remember, this material is a closely guarded secret. Although the gist of the story has been out there for many years, very little of the actual truth has ever been released to the public. Oh yes, well, by some of the renegades maybe, but many of them have been discredited. President. Okay, Bill, I guess we need advisor number one, you, Advisor 1-3, and Casper here. I think Advisor 1-2 and Michael can leave. Advisor 1-2, Mr. President, excuse me, but I would prefer to leave. I don't wish to know this information. You know, plausible denial or something like that. Michael Deaver, Mr. President, whatever you wish, I'll do. It would be an interesting subject, but do I really have a need to know? No, I don't think so. President, okay, I guess that is it. WMK say. Thank you, Mr. President. I will now turn the briefing over to the caretaker. Advisor 3. Mr. President and Mr. Director, I already had this briefing. I can stay or leave. Secretary Weinberger and myself received this a few weeks ago. Secretary Weinberger. Mr. President, as you know, we have some pending business regarding that Soviet problem in Berlin. I think we might just handle that. Advisor number 3 and I will let you close this meeting to just a few. President. Okay, Casp, I guess you and advisor number three can leave. Thanks for coming, WMKZ. Okay, Mr. President, that certainly narrows the audience. I think this is just right. President. Okay, well, I can't wait to hear this. Let's proceed. The caretaker. Good morning, Mr. President. First of all, I would like to give you a bit of information on my background. But before that, please, Mr. President, if you have questions during this briefing, just interrupt me, sir. I have been employed by the CIA for the past 31 years. I started the caretaking status of this project in 1960. We have a special group of people whom we call Group 6 that cares for all this information, President. Good morning, I hope. Well, I believe I will ask questions. Bill briefed me back in January, but I'm not sure. Huh. Well. Was it detailed? No, I don't think so. Huh. Okay. Well, I'm sure Bill didn't tell me all because we only had about one hour. U.M. Casey. Mr. President, I only gave you a quick briefing for the NSDD, National Security Decision Directives, that we want to incorporate into the overall action directives about this subject. Advisor number three, Casper and I have details far beyond what I knew before January. The last administration wasn't too keen on making all of this stuff accessible to us during the briefings in November and December. Presiden. Well, I knew a little about this subject before, back in 1970. Nixon had all of the good stuff and wanted to share it with some of his friends. Nixon showed me some papers. 
Not sure about who authored them, but they, huh. Well, something about New Mexico and other places. Nixon was pretty, huh. Well, you know, fascinated with it. He showed me something, some kind of object or device that came from one of their craft. Something that was taken from the New Mexico crash site. I don't know if, well, huh. Do we know what it was? I don't think we knew, or maybe now, after 11 years, we might know. The caretaker. Mr. President, I can answer some of those questions. Do you wish for me to begin? President. Oh, well, what level is this? I mean, what was it called? I don't remember what they called this. W.M. Casey. Mr. President. Code word. It's called Top Secret Code Word. This information is beyond top secret, as I said before. It has its own classification. It is very compartmentalized. President. Well, I guess just the minimum. Are we recording this? The caretaker. Mr. President, no, unless you wish. W.M. Casey. Yes, it is, CIA female transcriber. Who is doing that? I think we should. I don't want to make any mistakes later about this. Advisor number four should also stay, since he is one of the caretakers of the information. President. Well, I don't want anyone leaking this stuff. Not knowing what we are about to discuss? Huh. Oh, well, Bill, I guess it is your call. Advisor number four should stay. I guess he should... Huh. Oh, okay, well, you make the call, Bill. WMKC. Okay. I guess advisor number four will stay. But I think CIA female transcriber must stay. I'll make that call. President. Okay, I guess we can do our business first. Give me a few minutes. Let's get some food first, or snacks. How long will... Huh. Oh, about one hour? The caretaker. Mr. President, I estimate this will last about one hour, at least the first part of it. This is a very complicated subject to brief. I can do it, but maybe the questions will extend beyond the first, the time period. President. Okay, I see. Let's take a break and then reconvene. Break. The caretaker. Okay, Mr. President, are we ready? President. Yes, we are. Let's go. The caretaker. Mr. President, as was mentioned earlier, I must say that this briefing has the highest classification within the U.S. government. I will start with a slide presentation. I have most of this briefing on the slides, but I also have an outline that I have passed out to each person in attendance. President. Oh, okay. So are we, can we follow it with the outline paper? The caretaker. Yes, Mr. President. You can follow the briefing with the outline in front of you. President. Thank you. The caretaker. The United States of America has been visited by extraterrestrial visitors since 1947. We have proof of that. However, we also have some proof that Earth has been visited for many thousands of years by various races of extraterrestrial visitors. Mr. President, I'll just refer to those visits as ETs. In July 1947, a remark... If you are enjoying this, why not watch the full hour and 20 minute version? In fact, there's over 150 other long documentaries you can watch. They are on my Patreon page. It's only a couple of pounds and more content is added every week. Find out why Stonehenge is there. Find out who Yahweh really was. Learn that the crystal skulls are not fake. See Easter Island for what it really is. Understand the mark of the beast and so much more, all with evidence. Head over to patreon.com, Our True History. There's also free documentaries there. Click on Collections, then free. Watch an hour-long documentary on the Great Flood. Trust me, you won't find this kind of research anywhere else. Thanks for your support, our true history.